All right, so we are going to be doing a rhetorical analysis on Patrick Henry, as well as a couple other revolutionary authors. Remember we said most of the revolutionary authors are going to be what genre? They're going to fall into what genre of literature? Political, fiction or nonfiction? Nonfiction, okay? So today we're going to do a speech, okay? It's going to be Patrick Henry's speech to the Virginia Convention. It's better known as the give me liberty or give me death speech. You ever, you ever heard of that speech before? Okay. So this is the speech that convinced the colonies, really, to declare their independence, okay? So it's a very persuasive speech, and we're going to find out why it was so persuasive, okay? So the first thing that we should look at, all right, Patrick Henry, his biography. Real quick, the thing that you need to know is that he was born in 1736, which is around the time period of the Great Awakening. What was the Great Awakening, remember? Puritan thing where what happened? Yeah, a bunch of conversions. Everybody got saved. Everybody got converted, right? And he actually heard Jonathan Edwards preach, okay? Do you think that's going to leave an impact on you if you hear Jonathan Edwards preach in the flesh? I mean, it left an impact on you, and you just read it, okay? He listened to Jonathan Edwards' sermons, okay? So, that influenced his ability to speak, and so he saw all the techniques Jonathan Edwards used in his Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God sermons and other sermons, ethos, pathos, logos, and he said to himself, wow, this is really good. I should try using some of this. But instead of going into the ministry, he went in politics. Okay. He was elected to the Virginia House. Okay, They called it the House of Burgesses. Okay, which basically is just the fancy way of saying the state legislature. Okay? It's like there wasn't a state, at this point it was a colony. All right? So the Virginia House of Burgesses, he wrote numerous speeches. His most famous one was the one that ends, give me liberty or give me death. That was how he ended his speech. Now, was he just being exaggerating? Was he just being hyperbolic when he said that? Or did he actually literally mean, give me liberty or give me death? Actually meant it. How do we know he actually meant it? What happened? What would happen to somebody if they were caught or a, 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 suspected of being a patriot? And the uh, hung because of treason. Right. Remember when they all signed their Declaration of Independence, they were basically signing their death warrant. If the Americans lost the revolution, George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, Ben Franklin, all those people who were on our money would be dead. Okay? They would have been hanged as traitors. Okay? So. Patrick Henry literally is saying, I want freedom or death. I don't want to continue to be a slave of the British. Okay? I either want to be free or die. Because those, those were his two options. Okay. And like I said, Patrick Henry's speech played a key role in actually swinging Virginia to declare independence. Okay? He was not the first person to speak at this convention. He was probably the last guy to speak at the convention. All these other people spoke before him, okay? And most of the people who gave speeches before him, it was kind of an open forum, right? So Faye, would you like to make a comment? Maddie, would you like to make a comment? Please come forward, right? Everybody who had spoken before him up until that point had been a loyalist, meaning what? They were like Benjamin Martin and the Patriot. They were saying, you know what? I don't really want to do this. It would be very difficult to try and break away from Britain. The cost just isn't worth it. Why don't we just try and make peace with King George? Well, Patrick Henry, he's the last one to get up there, and he just sways the momentum all the way the other direction because he basically says, what have we been doing for the past 10 years? We've been trying to make peace with King George, and what's King George doing? Nothing, okay? So that's what Patrick Henry and what the influence of his speech. A month after he gave his speech, one month after we had the battles of Lexington and Concord, which is the shot heard around the world, okay, the first shot of the revolution, he motivated these people. He got them enthusiastic about fighting for independence. Okay? It became instead of a thing like, well, I guess we'll fight for independence, it became, yes, let's fight for independence. Okay? And like we said, it was dangerous. Now we're gonna do a rhetorical analysis, mainly couple different things. We're going to do a soapstone. You guys remember soapstone? 
Okay, when we did that from unit one, well, we're gonna get a refresher, okay? Speaker, occasion, audience, purpose, subject, tone. We're also gonna do fizz, okay? You guys remember fizz? Okay, figurative language, imagery, diction, details, and syntax, okay? We're gonna review them. And then ethos, pathos, logos. Hopefully you know those, right? You good on ethos, pathos, logos, okay? No, all right, Luke. I am persuading you. I am using ethos. How am I doing it? Uh, credibility. Okay, so how do I persuade somebody using credibility? Uh, you can tell them about your experience. Okay, I've been in this business for 20 years. Don't you trust me? Right? Okay. So, experience, credentials, okay, also ethics, right? Ethics means what? How good of a person are you? Am I more likely to believe a really morally good person or a morally evil person? <laughs> Morally good, right? Yeah. All right. Pathos. Pathos means persuasion with what? Feeling, emotion, not just sadness. I can make someone feel happy. I can make someone feel guilty. I can make someone feel angry, okay? So we're going to see how Patrick Henry does that. And then the last one is what? Logos meaning? Logic. Logic is facts. So the nutrition facts, okay? Buy our potato chips because look how many calories they have compared to the regular ones, right? Also, reasoning. Logic is reasoning as well. So, analogies. What's an analogy? Blank is like blank. Jonathan Edwards uses them all the time. Just like we step on a worm and don't think twice about it, what does God do? Steps on us. Okay. You want a JV sideline cheerleader? Okay. Gotcha. All right. Now there's a couple terms that we have not actually talked about, mainly one, okay? We've talked about rhetorical questions. What's a rhetorical question? Okay, it's a question that's not meant to be answered. It's a question for emphasis, to emphasize a point, right? So if someone farts and I know who it is and I wanna call attention to it, I wanna emphasize it, I'll walk right next to him and say, who cut the cheese, right? That is putting emphasis on a rhetorical question, all right? Restatement and repetition, those basically mean the same thing, okay? You are emphasizing something by saying it over and over again. Here's the one I want to focus on today, okay? Here's the one that might be new to you. What is parallelism? Parallelism, not a parallelogram, parallelism, okay? Maybe, Maddie, what'd you say? Ooh, you're close, but I like the word you use there, reflect, okay? Because a parallel line, a set of parallel lines, okay, would you say they're like mirror images of each other? Because they never cross, right? So two lines like this, okay? So parallelism is where you have two sentences or two parts of a sentence that are grammatically similar or grammatically mirror each other, okay? So an example might be, of the people, by the people, for the people, okay? The structure is very similar. You might say it mirrors each other. You have three words, blah, 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 okay? <laughs> Another example might be John F. Kennedy. Ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. But what you can do for your country. So the structure is the same, it's just slightly tweaked with different words. Okay, so parallelism is where you have sort of mirror image sentences, okay? Mirror image grammar, okay? Another example might be like this. For my own part, this is from Patrick Henry. Whatever the anguish of spirit it may cause, I am willing to know the whole truth, to know the worst, and to provide for it. To know, to know, to provide, okay? So instead of changing up the different verb forms, he uses the same structure again and again, okay? To know, to know, to provide. That's parallelism, okay? Because it adds a sort of what to the way he says it. Sort of, sort of cadence, sort of rhythm, okay? You said another example? So, if we're talking like, hey, what did you do this weekend, right? I spent the weekend um, 
watching movies, eating steak, and what's another thing I can spend the weekend Sleeping. doing? Sleeping. Easy. Okay? So that's parallelism right there because if you look at the verbs, watching movies, eating steak, and sleeping. Okay? Honestly, it would be more parallel if I said sleeping late. Okay? So the rhythm is similar with each part of the sentence. Watching movies, eating steak, sleeping late. Right? The cadence is the same. Okay? So that's parallelism. All right? This, this is not parallelism right here. Okay? To know, to know, I will provide. You notice the difference there. It's not the same. It's not the same reflection. Okay? Of the same verb form there. Yeah. So like in the sentence on the board, they all start with two, and then on that one, they all end in ing. So is it always going to be like that? Or is it always going to be if it's, like an ending or a word in Yes. If it's parallel, the verb forms are the same. They have to match. You can't have like this one, to know, to know, I will provide. Because that would be different. That wouldn't be parallel. Does that make sense? OK. So this is something Patrick Henry uses a lot of. OK. He likes to add this because why? What does parallelism add to a speech, especially a speech in particular? People like drill in the idea. OK. Drill in the idea. Isabella, what did you say? So emphasis, if I want to emphasize a point, right, and I want it to stick in the reader's brain, it's going to stick in their brain a lot easier if there's almost like a cadence to it, right? There's a rhythm to it. I'm willing to know the truth, I'm willing to know the worst, and to provide for it. Okay? So that's parallelism. All right? Any questions about those notes? Those are all your Patrick Henry notes that you need. Okay? Just make sure you write down what parallelism is, because this will be on your test for this unit. Okay? And I'll post this PowerPoint too, but I need you to write it down. Okay. Now, if you look at your worksheet, the rhetorical analysis for Patrick Henry, okay, as you see, it basically breaks it down into the three things. Soapstone, you're going to do a soapstone of it. So soapstone is speaker, obviously, means what? What are you going to find out? Who is speaking? Okay, and not only that, but why is that important for us to know who the speaker is? How does that help us understand the text better? Why do we care who the speaker is? Why don't we just read the speech and not care who the speaker is? You know where it's coming from, you know the background, you know the context. Okay, context is important. Occasion, what is the situation? What is the time and place surrounding it? Audience, that means what? Who is he directing his speech toward? Purpose is pretty easy. It's why is he speaking? What is he trying to do in the first place? Subject is just what the topic is. And then what's tone? How does Patrick Henry feel about his subject? Okay. Now, if you look on your sheet, you don't even have to come up with the words. All right. You have a bunch of words that are already out there. You just have to circle all that you think apply. Okay. All these tone words that you think apply to Patrick Henry's speech. Okay? Down there below it, you have bids. The F stands for what? Figurative language. What is figurative language? Metaphors, similes, illusions, idioms, and idioms. Gold star, good job. Okay? Imagery. What is imagery? Sensory details, using your five senses, descriptive sensory details, okay? What is diction? Word choice. Why does Patrick Henry use specific words over other words that he could use? What is the connotation and denotation of those words, okay? Details are just specific things that he talks about. And then what is syntax? Explain to me, why would we care about sentence structure? Okay. Would any of this go under syntax? Yes. Yes. Okay. So, 
Parallelism is a big part of syntax, as well as just does he use a lot of punchy, simple sentences? Does he try to have some elaborate, compound, complex sentence that he uses a lot? How does he speak? How does he construct his sentences? Okay? If it's a speech, more often than not, most people speak more clipped, simple, or compound sentences as opposed to long-winded, run-on sentences. Okay? If it's a speech, you want to be clear and direct. And then we already talked about ethos, pathos, logos, which is on the back. Don't worry about the second half of the back page. I marked that through. You don't have to worry about that. Okay? So that's what we are going to look at as we go through the speech. Okay? So go ahead and get out your speech. Okay? We're going to read it real quick. All right? We're going to do one read through, and then we'll go down to the pep rally. Okay? Right now, we're just reading it and looking for maybe examples that automatically pop out to us as, okay, ethos or pathos or logos or any of those things that apply. Wait, so we're okay? It out right now. Well, we're going to read it together. Okay? So we're not filling it out to, yeah, that's what for tomorrow is. Right now, we just want to read it. Okay? We're going to get one read through. All right. So this is Patrick Henry's speech. And it's always important to look at the little gray box of background at the top. So let's see what it says. On March 23rd, 1775, Patrick Henry delivered this rousing speech to the Virginia House of Burgesses, including future U.S. Presidents George Washington and Thomas Jefferson. They were there in attendance. They did not get up to speak at St. John's Church. His speech convinced the colony of Virginia to organize a militia to fight against British tyranny. What's tyranny? Right, someone who commits tyranny is what we call a tyrant, okay? Someone who abuses their power. <laughs> you think King George III abused his power yes. in it, okay? So as you read, take notes on the rhetorical devices that Henry uses in order to deliver his message. So we are going to do a quick read, but as we read, we're going to point out specific rhetorical devices that Patrick Henry uses, okay? So get your pencils ready, because I'm going to tell you certain things to mark or underline, okay? Mr. President, is he talking to the President of the United States? No. no, the United States does not exist yet. He's talking to the President of the Convention, okay? It is natural for man to indulge in the illusions of hope. It is natural for man to indulge in the illusions of hope. Remember, think about what I said about who he's following. All the speeches that came before Patrick Henry were, what did they believe? They wanted to stay loyal, okay? So Patrick Henry's getting up and he says, after all these loyalist speeches, it's natural to be fooled by illusions of hope. So what's he trying to say? He's saying it's an illusion, which means what? It's fake. It's what you want to be. It's what you want to believe is true. It's not what's actually true, okay? You ever really want something to be true so bad, even though all the evidence pointed to you that it was false? Okay? You ever wanted something to be true, but it really wasn't, you knew it? Okay? That's what he's saying is happening here. We are apt to shut our eyes against the painful truth and listen to that song of that siren till she transforms us into beasts. You ever read the Odyssey? Yes, yeah, it's the worst book ever. Okay? What's a siren? It's a woman, well, they portray themselves as a beautiful woman, and then they sing, and then they kill a murder, and they kill Right. You hear the beautiful song as you're sailing on your ship, and you steer your ship toward those beautiful women, and then what do you do? You crash on the rocks, right? So is a siren a good thing to listen to? No. So Patrick Henry is making an allusion, not I-L-L, -L, but A-L-L. -L, okay? He's making an allusion to the Odyssey. He's making a reference saying that you guys are listening to the siren song, okay? You're being fooled by believing that we can still have peace, okay? Is this the part of wise men engaged in a great and arduous struggle for liberty? Are we disposed to be the number of those who having eyes see not and having ears hear not the things which so nearly concern their temporal salvation? So he makes another allusion, but not to the Odyssey, but to what? What's that a reference to? Having eyes see not, but having ears hear not. It's a reference to the Bible, okay? So that's another illusion. It's a biblical illusion, okay? He's saying, 
You have eyes, but do you see anything? No. You have ears, but are you hearing anything? No. The evidence is right there in front of your face about what we have to do, but you don't want to do it. For my part, whatever anguish of spirit it may cost, I am willing, and there's the parallelism, to know the whole truth, to know the worst, and to provide for it. So here he is saying, you know what? You don't want to believe the truth. I'm willing to believe the truth. I'm willing to do something about it. Okay? So Patrick Henry now has their attention. Okay? He's saying, all you people are deluding yourselves, and now I'm going to explain to you why you're wrong. Okay? So now they're all listening. I have but one lamp by which my feet are guided, and it is the lamp of experience. I know of no way of judging the future but by the what? By the past. And by judging the past, I wish to know what there has been in the conduct of British ministry for the last 10 years to justify those hopes with which the gentlemen have been pleased to solace themselves in the house. So remember the timeline here. The Fresh and Indian War ends in 1765. That's exactly when they put the taxes out. They start taxing the colonies. This speech takes place in 1775. So how long have the colonies been dealing with these taxes, been dealing with King George? 10 years. Has anything changed? No. no. Every time King George repeals a tax or takes away a tax, he adds five more. Okay? So is talking working? No. no. Is it that insidious smile with which our petition has been lately received? Trust it not, sir. It will prove a snare to your feet. What's a snare? Like a trap. Suffer not yourselves to be betrayed with a kiss. There's another allusion to what? Uh, no? Who's the most famous person who was betrayed in history? Jesus. Jesus. Judas betrayed him with a kiss. Remember, he identified him by kissing him on the cheek. Okay? So, to be betrayed with a kiss means... Someone is going to, to your face, act like they love you, and then turn around and sell you, okay, or give you up, or betray you. So they're saying King George is doing that. They're comparing King George to Judas. Is that a nice comparison? No. Ask yourselves how this gracious reception of our petition comports with those warlike preparations which cover our waters and darken our land. Are fleets and armies necessary for a work of love and reconciliation? Have we shown ourselves so unwilling to be reconciled that force must be called in to win back our love? Let us not deceive ourselves, sir. These are the implements of war and subjugation, the last arguments to which kings resort. So now Patrick Henry is taking a different direction with the speech, and he's asking, why all this what? If the king loves us so much, why is he sending an army in? If the king loves us so much, why is he sending in his, all his battle fleet? What sense does that make? Which one of those three would that be? Ethos, pathos, or logos? He's using logic, isn't he? If the king loves us so much like he says he does, then why does he keep sending soldiers into our houses? Why does he keep sending his navies to blockade our ports? Okay. I asked gentlemen, Sir, what means this martial array if its purpose be not to force us into submission? Can gentlemen assign any other possible motive for it? Has Great Britain any enemy in this quarter of the world to call for all this accumulation of navies and armies? Teachers at this time, relate your students to go to the gym. All right. Oh, 10 minutes early. OK. Put this up. We'll finish this tomorrow. like 30 seconds.